We are in the last week of this series that we've called The Pursuit Of, and what we've been doing is walking through some different things that are calling out to us. It feels like there's this longing, right, to fill something that we want, something that we might think we need, uh, but we've, we've been on this constant pursuit of things in our life, okay? And one of the things that we, uh, let me just kind of walk through where we've been so far. We've talked about this pursuit of fame. And we did so talking about uh, John the Baptist and how John the Baptist was probably one of the most famous people of his day, but he kept saying, hey, it's not about me, it's about him, and he's pointing to Jesus all the time, which is what we should be doing, right? We, we talked about the pursuit of uh, money and stuff and how that is just kind of a natural thing for us to want more money because there's always more needs, uh, more stuff because that's what everybody else in the world does around us. We'll talk a little bit more about that today as well. Uh, then we went into this kind of an idea, uh, of this pursuit of perfection, how you might think, or I might think, this is the one I struggle with the most, by the way, uh, I might think that I've got to meet other people's expectations for me or high expectations for myself, or I might put more expectations on you because I feel like things have to be perfect around us. And, and then Paul said, no, 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 that's not the way uh, that life was designed to be, uh, where he figured out that there may be a thorn in his flesh or there is a thorn that he has, he's carrying around saying, hey, that imperfection has held me back a little bit, but it's also made me stronger because God has made strong in my weakness. And we said this pursuit of perfection is not going to fill a void because you're never going to attain it. We've all fallen short of the glory of God. We're all sinning, and it's always mistake prone in our lives. So quit trying to pursue perfection all the time and just lean into the fact that God is going to get that covered whenever we understand that we are imperfect people, and he's made strong in our weakness. And then last week, we talked about this pursuit of approval, how we need other people to accept us, or, or we want to be uh, approved by God even at times. And, and this approval thing is never going uh, to be attained either, because again, we've fallen short, and we got to stop trying to continuously chase after this idea that, man, if people just approve of who I am, uh, then I'm going to be better off. Whenever the reality is, we need to uh, approve the identity that God sees us, that Christ sees us as a child of God. So we, we've been chasing these things. We've been in this constant pursuit of specific things. And today, Actually, here, here's what, let me just go ahead and commend you right now, because I told you last week, we're going to talk about the pursuit of comforts, and I even gave you an out. If you're going to miss one, this might be the one. You guys showing up today. Uh, we had a lot of people showing up and filled up the seats, the first service as well, and, and this idea of comforts, you know, we might lean one way or the other on many of these things, and I promise you, this is going to hit, hit every one of us, especially me, because uh, I've feel myself struggling with all these things as well. It's going to hit all of us in specific ways. And it, it might be subtle in some ways, but man, it's going to show up that we are pursuing comfort in so many different ways. Uh, think about it in the world today. You know, we, we are we are challenged to, to live our best life, right? You might hear that. You might see that on a billboard somewhere. You're going to see it on commercials. You're living your best life. And many of us are going to be uh, seeing that and inundated with messages on social media of people trying to live their best life and showing that all the way around. How, ma how many of you are on social media in some way? Instagram, Facebook, Parlor, that's the popular one, right? Uh, no, I'm just kidding. I know it's not. Uh, TikTokers out there, you know, we're out there trying to live our best life. We're trying to show people that we're living our best life. And, and in, in my world, uh, I, I'm trying to figure out, okay, how do I live my best life by being comfortable? I'm, I'm right there as well. And, and sometimes we do that with the things that we wear, right? Am I wrong? I mean, because we really want to be comfortable uh, with what we wear. I was looking at this picture in my office. There's this uh, old sign, like from the 1940s. It's at uh, Wrigley Field. You guys know I'm a Cubs fan. Don't hold it against me. Just let me tell the illustration, all right? You can make fun of me later. There are thousands of people outside of these gates, probably because they never went to the playoffs and you knew it was a playoff game, right? Uh, so all these people outside the gates, and they are dressed up to go to a ball game in suits and ties and derbies and overcoats, right? Every one of them. 
Now, I go to a lot of baseball games, and I've been to a lot of baseball games around. That's not how people do it now. They are going as comfortable as they possibly can. They're wanting to wear their team colors. They're wanting to be comfortable in jerseys or whatever. And that's comfort to me. That wouldn't have been comfortable. Um, Today, you know what I see as comfort? I go to Walmart, and I see people shopping in their pajamas, right? That, that's the way we do it these days, right? That's more comfortable. And, and there is no shame for people. I'm going to live my best life. I'm just going to go out in my SpongeBob pajamas, whatever it may look like. It's just what people do. And then guys, you know, guys are wearing in our own world. How, how many of you guys have that comfortable shirt that you're just not going to get rid of, but your wife's trying to get rid of it, right? Yeah, you, you know what I mean. It might have a couple of holes up here. It might... Uh, not be very sightly if it's going to show up in a picture and, and it's going to, uh, guys can tend to hold on to things like that. Like, hey man, it's always worked for it for 20 years. I'm going to keep wearing it. It's fine. Same thing with socks and underwear. Um, <laughs> but w- you know, we, we say stuff like that, but women do this too. And their comfort women, two words, yoga pants. You're doing it right. You got your going out yoga pants. You got your staying home yoga pants and you're going to be comfortable. And however you want to be comfortable, because they go with everything. I, I understand this is how it goes. We're trying to be comfortable in our clothes. We, we do this in many different ways, right? We do it with our cars. I mean, you're trying to be comfortable, living your best life with your car. I, we do this a lot. And, and I'll tell you, I get a little jealous sometimes. I've told you that I, uh, in, in, my, in my world, in my life, every new car that I get now is actually going back a year. Uh, I had the last three cars I bought were I bought this 07 vehicle, and then an 06, and now I bought an 05, so it keeps going backwards. So whenever I see you guys with these new cars, I get a little bit jealous, truthfully. I I would love to have a new car. I realize that it's not in the cards right now, Um, but we want to be comfortable in our cars. I I think back to whenever I drove this 1987 Acura Integra in high school, okay? It was gold. It was sweet. Had this thing on the top that said D-O-H-C. I think it meant like dual overhead cam. I I have no clue what that means. I'm not a car guy. But it looked awesome. The problem was you get in that thing and you actually had to roll down the windows. Not real comfortable whenever you do that. It brought back like bad memories because when my dad drove us around in a little Chevy Love, I was a window guy. I had to do the windows all the time and reach over my sisters to do that. I was so happy whenever my sister got her first car and it was like a 1982 Chevy truck, and it had the same crank windows. I'm like, ha, ah, you deal with it now. Anyway, I was more comfortable because someone else was uncomfortable, I guess. So, but these days, it's different, right? We just push a button down. It's easy. Uh, and, and almost everybody, everybody should probably have that, right? Even to the point of not only do you push a button down to hold it, you can just push it, release it, it goes. It, it's just different. I, I get comfortable with the idea of what cars bring to us in key fobs. You know what I mean, right? My wife asked me to go get something from the car, and I can hit unlock. It, my wife's car, she's got a couple different key fobs. Neither one of them work very properly, and I think it might be the car. I can lock it with the key fob, and you can do it like from uh, inside the kitchen, and you can, hey, will you make sure the car's locked? Yeah, and it honks from in the kitchen. You can hear it. But if i got to unlock it, I have to take the key, I have to stick it in the keyhole, and I have to open it. It stinks. I, I don't like doing it. I don't know. We just get comfortable, right? There's leisure. You, you get real comfortable. Uh, and, and that's just not, some of us will be around here for an event and we'll be here at night sometimes or after a morning. And some of you guys, I get a little jealous because you're like, you got your keys in your pocket and you're literally starting your car from within your pocket. I'm like, you dog. All right. I, I want that life. Uh, we want to be comfortable. That, that's kind of how it is. So whether it's with our clothes, our car, our houses, I have a 70-inch screen, right? And they're cheap these days. But 70-inch, I literally wrestle with the idea of, should I get 70 or 75? Is it going to be big enough? <laughs> of course it's big enough. The people walking out behind my house on the g- golf cart path, they can see what we're watching inside. You know, it's plenty big. I, but, but I wonder if I'm going to be comfortable. Can I see it from the back of the kitchen? Can I see it from my bathroom? I, I, I don't know. Uh, how comfortable can you be in your house? We, we all have this comfort level. or uh, don't, don't forget about comfort food. You know, <laughs> comfort food, you know, chick fried steak, mashed potatoes, all, all that type of stuff. There, there's all kinds of comfort level in our lives. And, and we have personal comfort like smartphones. Uh, we couldn't do life without it, right? 
Or how about, just think about your earbuds. I don't even see wires anymore uh, out in this world. Rarely do you see it. It's earbuds all the time. You guys don't, don't even understand. It's not just the wires that we dealt with, but the discman that you had to keep perfectly balanced <laughs> to listen to that music. But you don't even have to worry about wires. Uh, or, or our smart watches telling us how many steps that we've taken or, or what's coming up next on the, the appointment. We live lives of comfort and we don't even realize it. That's our life. And here's the problem. The world tells us that's the way it's supposed to be. That everything is supposed to be easy. It's always going to be easy. And, and I was struggling with this the other day because we were talking about the whole TV thing. And, and I thought about, we can't go much further in life. But the reality is, it's going to get easier. Things will get easier all the time. And life will become more comfortable. And there's this constant pursuit of comfort. We all do it whether it's subtly or whether we go all in on it, right? And this endless pursuit of comfort is really defined by a life of ease more than a life of struggle. And that's what we want. We want life to be easier. And if the world's going to provide it, why not just lean into that? We pursue comfort. And when we pursue comfort, here's basically what we're saying. Basically, we're saying, listen, I want to build a life, God, where you aren't needed too much. I'm not saying we say this out loud with our words, but we live it. Because when we have things that are done for us all the time and everything's comfortable, then we really don't need God. This is how we build our lives. And this is the danger in this. And this is why we don't want to pursue comfort. And, and really what we want to hit on today is this, is that you cannot pursue comforts and walk by faith at the same time. You can't live in both worlds. You can't pursue the comforts, the comfortable things, and live by faith at the same thing, time. And you can't walk by faith if you're living, pursuing comfort all the time. Jesus uh, made, made a habit out of challenging people in, in these ways. The, these two things are opposite. These two ideas are going to be opposite. And, and when Jesus challenged people, he was challenging them to stretch these faith muscles. So if people came and, and asked him a question, you know what he was going to do? He'd answer it with something that was going to stretch their faith. And I love how he did that all the time. Because that's what we need all the time. Because whenever the world says, here, this is, this is the way it's supposed to be, we need someone else from a higher perspective saying, no, actually, let's look at it from a different perspective. And there's always going to be these people that were reaching out to Jesus. They're walking along uh, the way. And uh, people would have asked him questions, and one guy asked a, a specific question uh, about what was needed in, in his life. And he says, all these different things. I, Luke chapter 9 is where we're going to be today, and if you want to get to your Bibles, I'd love for you to get there with me. But at the very end of the chapter, we're told about this guy who came and approached Jesus. Now, the apostle Peter is probably the guy who's telling Luke, the writer of this gospel, uh, this gospel is the, the good news of Jesus, right? And this gospel account was written by Luke. Luke did not walk with Jesus. The apostle Peter did walk with Jesus. And then the apostle Peter went on some missions, missionary journeys with Luke. So he told him all this stuff. This is what he told Luke. He said one time, as they were going along, the, verse 57, okay? At the very end of Luke. As they were going along, someone said to Jesus, I will follow you wherever you will go. All right? This is someone saying, I'm going to be a follower of you, Jesus. And Jesus said to him, foxes have holes and birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. What Jesus is basically answering right here is this. I don't live this life of comfort. You understand, if you're going to say, I'm going to follow you wherever you go, I don't live a life of comfort. Actually, I'm homeless. You want to be homeless? You want to live this life? You want to follow me wherever? Because this is what it looks like. All right, this, this is how Jesus is mentioned. He says, He's talking specifically about a comfortable life. And as we wrap this series up, I, I really want to ask you this one question. Has the pursuit of comfort kept you from following Jesus? Because you know when it's pulled you away or when, whether it's steered you towards him. And, and, and we got to ask ourselves this question. Has the pursuit of comfort kept you from following Jesus? Because we like our flat screens. We like our laptops. We like our houses. We like our leather seats in our cars. We like all these things. We like our smart watches. 
But do we really like the challenge, am I going to follow comfort or am I going to follow Jesus? Do we like that? I'm going to guess that most of us don't like to be asked that question. But Jesus says, well, there's no way around it. You need to deal with it if you're going to be a follower of me. We like our comfort. Last week, one of of our guys stopped me uh, as we were walking out, and he said, hey, you're going to have to stop preaching right at me. (laughs) And and I said, listen, this is fine, but I promise you, you're not the only person who's talked to me about this. And and I'm going to say this, whether it was one about approval, whether it was about perfection two weeks ago, someone said something, whether it was about money and stuff, and Walter talked about how people had talked to him about it as well, we're all dealing with it. I'm going to say this, I think every one of us, are probably going to feel like I'm preaching right at you. I promise you I'm not. I know that this is an issue for all of us. Nobody's told me what you've done or how you live, okay? I know how I live, and I know it's a struggle for me. So we're all on this journey together. I want you to go on it with me, okay? So this is what it talks, uh, this is what Jesus talks about, what it means to be his follower. So we're going to back up at the beginning part of this chapter. Look at Luke chapter 9. We're going to look at verse 21 whenever Jesus was asked by his disciples, hey, who do people say I am? And he, he asked the disciples, who, who do these people say I am? And they're talking, and Peter responds, you're the Christ, you're the Messiah, you're the Savior. Uh, and he says, well, let me tell you what this means. Let me tell you who I am. So he tells his disciples this, verse 21. And he strictly charged and commanded them to tell this to no one. And he said this in verse 22, the Son of Man, which is what he called himself quite often, must suffer many things, and be rejected by the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed, and on the third day be raised. What we see right here is that everything about Jesus' life was the opposite of comfort. That everything his life was going towards was the opposite of comfort. That all these people who were living this religious life or who were, who were uh, telling people this is what it means to follow God, even those people, the chief priests and the elders and the scribes, they're going to kill Jesus. You want to follow this man, you understand you're following a man who's about to go through some pain and some suffering. It's the opposite of comfort. So when you think about who Jesus says he is and what we say we're following, we're following someone who is on his way to death and that his life purpose was death. We understand that? It's a temporary thing because he says there at the end, he will be raised, right? Death becomes his life purpose. We've got to remember that his crucifixion precedes his resurrection. Now, on Easter, in a few months, we're going to celebrate, and it's one of the greatest days uh, of a church's uh, yearly events, right? Or, or this is what we love to celebrate, the resurrection. But before the resurrection became, or came the, res- the crucifixion, we've got to understand that. There was pain, there was suffering, there was death. This next verse, we see things that are part of following Jesus. Look at what it says. It's all about surrender and sacrifice. He says in verse 23, he said to all, if anyone's going to come after me, anyone who's going to follow me, Jesus says, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. Now, this is where we're going to spend most of our time today. Because I think that this is what he's speaking to when it's talking about us pursuing comfort. He says, deny himself. Deny himself. Deny herself. Deny yourself. These are the things that we need to understand. This is completely contrary uh, to the message of our flesh, as the world might say. The world says, hey, you do you. You live your best life. Jesus says, no, you deny you. You deny that life. Deny yourself and everything that you can. Deny is not just saying no to yourself. Denying, it means that you don't even acknowledge yourself. Now, this is a tough truth that we need to acknowledge here. It means, it kind of goes back to John the Baptist. Whenever John the Baptist says, he must increase, I must decrease. He must become more, I must become less. Deny yourself. This is the message of Christianity, church. I mean, we have to understand this. If we can't get this, we can't get anything. We talk about following Jesus as our Savior. It's about less of us, more of him. Every time it goes back to this. When you deny yourself, it means you completely surrender. But what we tend to do in our world, in our culture, is replace deny yourself with indulge yourself. Give in to yourself. Fulfill yourself. I don't know if anybody ever watched Parks and Rec. Have you ever watched that? Yeah, treat yourself. Treat yourself. 
This is what we tell ourselves. We need a day for me. I just need a day for me sometimes. Man, this is something that is even a struggle within my own household with my kids. What about me this time? That's fine. But what happens if you just deny yourself? You deny yourself today. Imagine what God does for you later. Make it about something bigger than yourself. It's not about us. You know, if all our needs are met and if we're all comfortable, then we say God is good. But, and some preachers are going to tell you that. But I'm, I'm here to tell you that's not the way that Jesus said anything about this. The Bible tells us the true meaning and the true satisfaction of life doesn't come when we put ourselves at the center. It comes when we put him at the center. And, and we, we have to understand that when we deny ourselves, we are not the epicenter of the universe. The world does not revolve around Ryan Fankhauser. I'm supposed to revolve around God and around Jesus. And we've got to change our little planetary fixation with who we think we are. We are not the ones that are being orbited around. We are orbiting around him. We've got to put that to the center. And you can't separate salvation and surrender. They're one and the same. It, it, they come together. Salvation, surrender. Jesus not only wants to be our Savior, but he wants, us, he wants to be our Lord. And that sounds weird. It sounds crazy. But he wants to be the everything in our life. I mean, he is our creator. We should probably give that to him. But he wants us to be. There's no real life unless there's death. But one of the things that I'll repeat over and over to my kids as a father, is to deny yourself, die to self. One of the things, and we're going to do a baptism here in just a little bit, and any time that I talk with one of our young people or any of our people who are talking about what baptism is in their life, I say, you know what baptism is? It's simply dying to self. I mean, this is a symbolism of you burying that old self, putting that to rest, living this new life towards Jesus. That's what it is. There's nothing magical about the water. But it's me as a person saying, I'm going to deny myself, put that to rest, and live this new life with God. And unfortunately, so many people are turning their faith into some kind of Christian capitalism. You know, what, what, it's all about me. What can I do for me? What do I get out of this life? If I put this in, what am I getting out of it? Does it make me happy? The reason that I'm here today is about me. And some of us walk into church that way sometimes, right? What am I going to get out of it? I hope he talks about this. I really need to hear about this. And somewhere deep inside, it's like, yeah, God's going to take care of that stuff that you need to hear. But I promise you, it's not about you alone. It's not about what I say alone. It's about what we as a church need to be edified into becoming. Who are we going to be for this community? What is he going to do through us? So when you come in here as a guest, and, and I, God bless any of our guests who are coming and say, what do you got for my family? But I promise you, that's not the end of it. And, and, and we're going to show you the kids' classes and what it looks like in the elementary uh, age upstairs, what it looks like in our early childhood. And, and we're going to talk about what youth looks like on Wednesdays and what a small group environment looks like for you as an adult. But that's not where it ends. It's not about what you get out of it. It's about what you bring to God. And it's always about denying self and living for him. You know, it's not about what song we can sing for me, and I hope we do this. It's not about church shopping. It's about what I can give to him. God isn't challenging us to be the most comfortable we can be. God is challenging us, more interested in our character than your comfort. He wants us to say no to self. He's more interested in our making our life holy and set apart than happy. Uh, that's what it's about. Does God want to make you happy? Yeah. Hey, God wants you to be happy. Sure he does. But he, I mean, he created you to be happy. He created you to enjoy life. But there are things that God longs for in our lives, for my life and yours, much more than just our happiness. He longs for our obedience. He, he longs for our Christ-likeness. So deny yourself. And he says the second phrase, that was a lot on that phrase, but he says the second phrase that connects closely to it, take up your cross. Deny yourself, take up your cross. What does that mean? I mean, for us, in our world today, the cross is the Christian symbol. It is the symbol of our faith, and that's what most people are going to see. You see a necklace, it's going to look, oh, that person must 
have some connection to Jesus. Probably, you hope so, right? And, and it, honestly, it sounds a little bit poetic in language uh, when we just read it. Take up your cross daily. I promise you Jesus did not mean this as poetic. Jesus knew his audience. He knew who he was talking to. And he knew that the guys he was talking to saw people going to the cross all the time. They were getting crucified. And what he's saying is, take up this idea of death in your life. It's all about you dying to self. So again, it, it kind of goes, and the cross wasn't meant to be jewelry. It wasn't meant to be some, some piece of architecture on a church. It, it, it was always about death and execution. It was a symbol of shame. It was a symbol of defeat. It was a symbol of humiliation. And Jesus says, except that, that you are going to have to die to self. The crucifixion wasn't meant to be some beautiful poetry. It wasn't going to be polite conversation. There are companies and organizations today that are looking for a logo. I promise you, they wouldn't be looking for a cross because it wouldn't have been about death. They want it to <laughs> exude life in some way. But that's what Jesus chose, this symbol of sacrifice. So let's look at verse 24. Let's move forward. He says, for whoever will save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake will save it. Again, this is a complete reversal of what the world is telling us, right? Jesus says, you want to save your life? Lose it. Just a different way of saying deny yourself. Lose it. We think uh, we have to be comfortable with every aspect of our lives. And Jesus says, what you really need to do is lose all that stuff. Lose all that idea of what is comfortable in your life. Verse 25, for what does it profit a man if he gains the whole world? And Jesus says, and if he loses or forfeits himself, what, what does it profit? To me, this goes back to what we were talking about last week with approval. We we're in the Sermon on the Mount, and we we're talking about when, when people pray or give or fast in public, and Jesus says, hey, they're going to receive their reward. And, and I think this closely connected to this. What profit do you have if you just indulge yourself and treat yourself all the time? It's going to profit you like that much, that quick on the timeline of eternity. And Jesus is saying it's not much profit at all. It's all temporary. It's not eternal. There's going to be people who live in comfort, and there's going to be people who live for Jesus. And, 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 and this is what he's trying to say, that there is not much comfort in the temporary it's a lot more comfortable in the eternal. Let me explain that. In verse 26, he says, Whoever is ashamed of me, whoever is ashamed of me and my words of him will the Son of Man, again, that's what he calls himself, whoever is ashamed of me and my words of him, the Son of Man will be ashamed when he comes in his glory and the glory of the Father and of the holy angels. Now, one thing we need to know, Jesus is coming again in glory. We need to understand that. There is a win at the end of this. There is glory. It is going to be a beautiful day, and it's going to be awesome. It's what we sing about. It's this glorious day, this wonderful day. This is what we want. He's going to reign as king, and it's going to be different than what these disciples thought it was going to be. He said, hey, it's not now. It's going to be later because you think it's right now, and you think it's going to be the salvation of this current culture because what the Jews were dealing with back then was this Roman uh, government oppressing them and they needed, they wanted salvation from that. And Jesus said, I'll, I'll here, I'm here to redeem mankind. But it's not from some government. It's from your sin. It's from what's enslaving you, what's holding you down in chains. And, and Jesus says, I'm, I'm coming and you're going to be free. But it's going to be contrary to what you think. And he's asking us to live in these ways that are contrary to what the world thinks. There are going to be those who want to live in comfort. And there are going to be those who live for Jesus. And here's what this text right here in 26 says. He says, if you live for comfort, man, what a shame that's going to be. It's kind of like, I was thinking about it this way. It's kind of like as a dad, whenever you're, as, as a kid, whenever your dad says to you, you know what? I'm not mad at you. I'm disappointed. <laughs> that's the worst, right? Oh, no, not the disappointment. Uh, yeah, I'm disappointed. It's kind of like, that's what I think Jesus, you know what? I'm not mad but man, I'm kind of disappointed. What a shame that you made that decision. I think what he's telling us, church, Christ followers, Jesus followers, was you know better. We know better. 
And we still choose what is a disappointment. We still choose the temporary. We still choose shame. We still choose to go this temporary path. And Jesus says, man, what a shame. You had so much that you could have done. You have so much that you could be. Man, what a shame. That's what I'm reading there. And that whoever is ashamed of me, the Son of Man will be ashamed of them whenever he comes to glory. It'd just be sad. What a disappointment. God has a better purpose for us than that. He promises a better purpose. It might not be here, it might be now. It's not on the snap of the timeline of eternity, but it's going to be a lot longer. And it's going to be better than what we're living on this earth. And I think the Apostle Paul gets this. If you say anything about the Apostle Paul, he comes after this first wave of apostles, this first wave of disciples, this first wave of followers of Jesus. He sees all this happen. Of course, he is persecuting the church in this. And Jesus has his face-to-face meeting with him saying, hey, why are you doing this? And Paul says, I don't know. I guess I'm just living for me and the way this religious you know, people want me to live. Right? And, and Paul says, okay, I'm ready to go all in on you. And, and whenever he does this, he says, I've got an opportunity And God gifted him with the ability to write and to encourage and to edify a church. And this happens over and over and over again. And Paul so badly wanted to go to this place in Rome because he knew that Rome was the epicenter of the population of the world. And it was booming. And if I could just influence those people first, then it will trickle down to everybody else. So Paul writes these words. He says, all these things that we're chasing after, all these things that you think uh, are are going to be eternal. I promise you they're not. It's just going to be a snap. Quit living for that because it's just going to give you pain and it's going to give you suffering. And this is what he says in Romans chapter 8. Verse 18, he says, Yet what we suffer now is nothing compared to the glory that he will reveal to us later. You're going through something that is so small and this struggle that you think is big in your life, that i got to keep up with this and this and this and pursue all these different things. But I promise you, I've got something greater for you later. Nothing will compare to the glory of eternity with Jesus. I'm going to tell you this, church. We are wired with this eternal longing. God wired us this way. He, He wired us. The Bible says that God set eternity on our hearts. He wired us differently. So this drive for us to attain and to pursue all these things, I mean, it's natural. The problem is, is that we're just trying to pursue the wrong things. And if we can shift that pursuit towards the one who matters, then everything changes. And then we're able to fulfill that pursuit in our lives. This is the last thing I want to tell you. This main idea is this. If you try to fulfill an eternal longing with temporary comfort, your life is going to be empty. You cannot keep striving to fill it with all these things, with fame and money and perfection and approval and comfort. You can't do it because your life's going to be empty. And some of us are experiencing that right now, and we know it. So let's don't long for the empty. Let's long for the thing that's going to fulfill the, the, the needs that we have. Let's long for the eternity. This idea of following Jesus is your best life. That's what it is. What are you going to do? Are you going to surrender and sacrifice, or are you going to give in to the snap, to the temporary? I think Jesus wants more for us today. Let's pray. Father God, we are grateful to be challenged. I, I speak, obviously, for myself, God, but I hope and pray that I speak for this church that we're grateful to be challenged, to move forward, to to take on the pain and suffering at times for the sake of eternity. I know that each one of us uh, we might be carrying this different baggage or this different weight and these different ideas of, of what it means to uh, be complete and fulfilled. And God, you, you've got one way for us to accomplish all that. Less of us, more of him. Help us, God, to deny ourselves. Help us, God, to take up the comfort of the cross, the comfort of everything that covered all of our sin and all of our shame. Help us not to be ashamed of you and your son Jesus now 
and help us to put off that stuff from the world and take on and be clothed with Christ. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.